Ding. Okay, so um, let's begin then. So this is mechanical lesson number five, uh, our last lesson. So as we always do, let's do a quick review from lesson number three. Uh, again, you want to turn on your microphones or just type in the chat. That's how you can answer. And the question is, what are the two main types of intakes? And with that, we kind of talked about, so one of the subsystems, subsystems we talked about last time was intakes. And we kind of talked about two main purposes they serve. Like they can do two types of things with the game objects. Um, so if you remember, just just give it a guess. I There's kind of, there's like two, it's almost like four because there's two in each category. So honestly, if you give me either one, I'll consider that correct. I only have the one I'm thinking of on the slide list, but there's another one that's valid. So just go ahead and give it a guess. What are the types of intakes? Yeah, MB. Um, so like one, one which has compressed, so like there's one we, one a row of wheels on the top and then they sort of collect the ball and there are two on the sides so that's the other one okay yeah so, so you're thinking yeah 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 that's valid that's valid so two definitely two types of intakes yep you got like the kind of the horde like like this when it spins and you got like the other one was like this one and, and this one on each side is that what you're talking about yep okay yeah that's valid uh those are two types. There's another. There's another two types of thinking. But thinking about like more generally speaking, like, uh, like for different games, right? Okay, let's think about the different types of intake. Like, so there was. Okay, let's, I'll just give it away. Um, so you basically got things that grasp, and you got like roller intakes. So that's more generally speaking, because things that grasp, like let's say the I don't remember which game this was. So just, this, the name is slipping my mind, but it's a game with a large uh yellow cube, uh, which we had a robot demonstration for. Before I think we broke it, but that's besides the point. Um, basically, you would have to like hold this cube, and that would be considered an intake because and, you know there's even wheels on it. That was specifically the one where there's the wheels on each side like that, spinning that way, and then it would intake the cube. But that was not to like intake it and put it into the robot and then put it to a shooter or put it somewhere else. It was just to grasp and hold on to it. Like you could have a claw as well, which is another type of intake that grasps. And the other thing is rollers, which is typically going to be used for game objects that you want to take from the field. The playing field or like any sort of depositing area take that and put it into your robot kind of store a bunch of them up and then shoot them or do anything you want with them so those are the two main types on the the other two types was which way i think that might be my next question oh spoilers yeah so that's another thing so there's many different types we're just we're kind of basically covering those down in kind of broken up sections so in terms of intakes now uh with the intakes that spin this way the most common ones in frc the ones we if anyone knew the ones we had on our robot last year what are the two types of those type of intakes? Like the two ways you can get the ball from the floor and into the robot. So we did one of them obviously last year and we were kind of debating, which, or should we do this one or should we do that one? And then we decided to do one of them. So does anyone have any guesses for what um, two kinds of major ways? We talked about this last time, of course. Uh, and you have the horizontal roller intakes and how like kind of the path that the ball is going to go from the floor into the robot. There's two kind of paths it can take. So does anyone remember those two paths? No. I'll reveal it because you might be thinking of a lot of things. You can take a guess if you're not sure. That's absolutely okay. No guesses? Okay. Uh, so basically, you have over the bumper intakes and you have through bumper intakes. So the image on the left is an over the bumper, which means a ball is going to kind of ride on top of the bumper. And the one on the right is where there's like literally a cutout in the bumper, like a space for the object to enter. And the object enters through there. So those are the two main types of like horizontal roller intakes. OK, another question. Does anyone remember what the mechanism wheels on the intake are used for? Right, so we talked about mechanism wheels. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Okay, depending on the vector, they can push the let's say a ball inside on towards the center of the robot yep that's absolutely depending on how the vector is positioned that's absolutely correct uh they're going to help center your game piece so even if you intake so when it touches the mechanisms it's going to kind of scoop that in towards the center or where you could have this normal rubber wheel or anything to actually intake it so that's 100 percent correct uh they're going to kind of bring the balls to or whatever the game object is towards the center awesome so we kind of went over, remember we went over intakes and shooters. So, oh my goodness. Well, that spoiled it, which is unfortunate. Um, but <laughs> I forgot to put an animation on that. I just left it there. Name some types of shooters. 
you kind of got a pretty big hint because I left all the answers on screen for a second. Um, but go ahead and try to name some types of shooters. We talked about a lot, so this is a pretty good chance if you describe basically anything, it'll be in one of those categories. What do you think, Aditya? Um, for one, they're catapults. Those are kind of shooters. Hundred percent. Yep. Usually, they use tension to just sort of fling something towards a direction. Correct. Yep, that's one of them. I think is wait, MS. Are you Maxwell or no? MS is me. Okay, perfect, Maxwell. Were you here last time? I think you were, right? Yeah, I was. So, do you have any, do you have any uh, ideas what the type of a shooter could be? Did you mention catapult? Oh, sorry. Uh, sorry, I spaced out for a while. So, what we've only mentioned catapult. Yeah, that's all we mentioned. There's, there's the catapult one. There's the flywheel one. There's the punch one. One where there's a force in the back. Okay, puncher. And perfect. The flywheel. The flywheel ones can be either two wheel or one wheel. Good. Good. Yep. So let's say that's um, well. There's a little bit more distinction to have had there in the flywheels. So let's say we got puncher and let's say we got catapult. Uh, KP. You got any ideas? No. Okay. Sounds good. Uh, all right. So I'll go ahead and reveal them. Does anyone else have any other ideas? So Maxwell was on the right track there. We're talking about flywheels. Those are the only remaining ones, but there's a little bit more specification we can get. He mentioned there's single and double flywheels, but even within single and double flywheels, there's another distinction to be made, like another two categories within those two categories. Does anybody remember what that, what those are? So in total, there's a four, there's four shooters that use flywheels. Two of them, like two, two of them generally have the part, like wait, two of them have the attribute of having one wheel and two of them have the attribute of having uh, two wheels. But there's another attribute that separates them as well. So I'll go ahead and show that now. That's essentially if they're just horizontal or they're vertical shooters. So you have your double flywheel and your single flywheel, yes. And then you also have your vertical and horizontal. So if you look on the right-hand side, the big red ball, that's a puncher. The one above it with the purple robot, that's a catapult. The one to the left of the purple robot, that's a single flywheel vertical. Uh, this In this specific case, it even has an adjustable hood. Uh, if you go look at the image all the way on the bottom left with the uh, orange ring, that's a single flywheel horizontal. And then the image right beside that to the right, that's a double wheel vertical. And the image to the right of that, the last rightmost image, that's a double horizontal. So those are all your different types of shooters. Um, we talked about some advantages of them. So like you can cover that, that's pretty important. So we can cover that as well. So for example, um, with your single flywheel, with your single flywheel vertical, uh, if you have an adjustable hood, that's gonna give you a lot better adjustability because changing the angle of the hood is far superior to just changing the speed of the arc, uh, of the wheel. And additionally, if you have some type of ball object, a single flywheel is going to put a good amount of spin on the ball because, and then when any ball has spin, this can be more stable in the air. Whereas a catapult, a catapult and a puncher are going to put zero spin on your object. So those are the disadvantages of those things. Those objects are going to have no spin because if you'd like, okay, it's more prevalent with frisbees, but even with balls, when you're throwing a ball, like if you ever if you ever seen um, if you've ever seen someone throw a ball, they typically will like let it go off the ends of their fingers when they're throwing it, and that's to put some spin on the ball. Like if you've watched cricket or stuff, they put spin on the ball so it's more stable. And well, actually, they do it to like mess the um, the pitcher up, but like you could, it would also make the ball more stable in the air. So that's so that's the advantage of flywheels. Whereas the um, whereas the catapults and punchers. If you just hit a ball, it's not going to have any spin on it. It's just going to fly forward, but no spin. So it's not going to be as stable. The horizontal flywheel is also interesting. Um, the double one, I'm, the horizontal, the, the double flywheel horizontal, because you're going to be able to actually change the horizontal trajectory, not just the vertical. So not like where it hits vertically, but also this way. Because uh, with that, you're going to be able to, because you slow down one wheel, speed up another, it'll curve either this way or that way. And which can also make it really useful if you're trying to adjust to something, which is actually the what we had on our robot last year, our 2020 robot. Um, double flywheel vertical is not used typically that often, um, but ha it has its own merit as well. With that, you're also able to put spin on the ball because you could spin one of them slower and one of them faster. Um, so they do have to be controlled by two separate motors if you want to put any spin on the ball at least. Um, 
And then the single flywheels with a single one flywheel vertical, you typically have a hood. That way you're able to adjust the angle and you're able to more like easily uh, change where the ball lands more accurately versus when you change the speed. Because when you change the speed, it changes drastically where the ball lands. Whereas when you change the angle, uh, you have more fine tuning capability, which makes you more accurate. All right. So we talked about in the last time we talked about drive trains, intakes, and shooters. The last thing we're going to talk about are lifts. So lifts, um, basically, in my opinion, are the most complex subsystem out of them all. Uh, again, if I were to, if you're thinking stable, then football, yeah, for sure. Um, that ball also has a spin on it. I'm pretty sure. Uh, if you were to throw it, you probably want to, you know, put a spin on that as well. And but that has a completely different shape, which has makes it its own unique properties with that. Um, but again, it's spinning because anything that spins is all typically more stable, especially a frisbee. Like if you think about a frisbee, imagine throwing a frisbee without spinning it. It's going to be super inaccurate. Like if you just hit it, it's not going to go anywhere. You have to actually put a spin to it. That's the only way it's going to go anywhere. So yeah. Uh, that's what the shooter is. Now we're going to move on to lifts. So there's basically two main purposes for lifts. You either want to get an object on the floor higher up, which is what you see on the right-hand side, or you want to get a robot on the floor higher up, which you see on the left-hand side, which is typically called hanging, which was pre uh, prevalent in last year's game because there was a switch, which you can actually see in the image. That's a specific game from last year uh, where your robot would have to go and hang on top of that. So you're taking the robot from the ground up, or you're taking some type of object, which is the kind of that's the yellow. I mean, sorry, yeah, that's the yellow box I was referring to. Um, with that, when we when initially talking about intakes, that's the yellow box, and you can see that there's a there's a lift to raise it up high. So basically, you're, again, you have two purposes: you either want to lift the robot up, or you want to lift an object up. Okay, so we'll get started with the easiest type of lifts, um, which are non-parallel lifts or arms. So we uh, kind of talked about this actually in our first session. Well, I'll, I'll get to that later, but we can do a quick recap. Well, our, an arm is just something that's going to be driven um, at the pivot point. So you can, you can actually have two arms, two types of arms, but they're basically going to move around a, a central pivot point. The advantages of them is that they're really simple um, because, like, you know, it's literally just there's nothing you can think of as simpler than that to give you some vertical motion. Anything else would become more complex, like, uh, whereas an arm is just something on a pivot point, you spin the pivot point, and boom, you got motion in the arm. Uh, and there's, a, there's two different ways we can talk about driving it. So we have driving at the point and driving close to the pivot point. Um, so first of all, driving at the pivot point, which means uh, if, you, if you look at the image on the right-hand side of the screen, you can actually see kind of where, you know, at the pivot point of the arm, there's this chain attached to this really big sprocket. Everything's yellow, so it's kind of hard to see because there's no distinction. But you see this black chain attached to the around the pivot point of the arm. That's because that's a sprocket. So when the motor spins, it's going to spin that whole length of chain that actually leads all the way down to the bottom of the robot. And it's going to rotate that sprocket, which is connected to the arm. So the whole thing is going to turn. The problem with that is it takes a lot of force, a lot of torque, because you're moving an object. Remember, we talked about levers. That's where that's coming back into play in the first lesson. You have a really large lever. And the force is working against you in this case because uh, you're moving it from the pivot point and you have all that leverage working against you. So that's why it requires a lot of torque. Um, additionally, all arms should have counterweights so that you really help alleviate the work on the motor. So if that's going to be some rubber bands or springs or just even some weight on the other side of the arm, so that way it turns into more of a seesaw situation than a, um, just a lever situation. Because now you're going to have some other weight on the other side that's going to help counteract the weight um, on the other end. Now, typically, you don't have that counterweight, the length that it's attached to from the pivot point. It's much shorter than the actual length of the arm. Otherwise, you're basically going to take up twice as much space on both sides. So it's typically a lot, lot shorter. But what that means then is that you have to put a lot, you have to put that much more force into it to counteract the weight of the object at the end of the longer arm, right? Because we we talked about this about if we I know how to balance levers, um, the the kind of the real force exerted on the lever is going to be the force you put on whatever end multiplied by its distance, right? So if your distance is a lot smaller, you're going to, have to put a lot more force, which is your counterweight, to actually balance the force of your manipulator on the end of your arm, because that's a lot further away than your counterweight is going to be from your other side of the arm. And the other type of arm we have, it again rotates at a pivot point, but this time you don't drive it from the pivot point, you have to drive it just close to the pivot point. So you can see that there's a linear actuator 
um, that's kind of connected. It's it's labeled in the diagram. That's connected uh, close to the pivot point. So it's like instead of trying to uh, twist it right from where it, where as the pivot point, you're kind of twisting it close to it. So if if you move your elbow like this, you're trying you're basically moving it from here instead of moving it, um, you know, kind of right from the joint. And the advantage of that is you at least get some mechanical advantage there. Um, you still you're still you're still going to be at a mechanical disadvantage because the majority of the weight is actually at a leverage further from you. Um, but you basically, it's better than moving it closer to the pivot point. So basically the further you move away from the pivot point in that actuation, the more mechanical advantage you're going to get. The issue is that the further you move away, the larger distance you have to move to actually actuate that arm. If you, and let's say you move all the way to the end, for example. Now at that point, if you're able to move the entire distance of that arm, that arm has no purpose because your linear actuator is already able to go that high up. So you don't even need an arm. Um, which would actually be better anyway, because you'd have to remain parallel to the ground. So that's why you can't put it all the way at the end of the arm, because let's say the arm needs to go up this high. If you're, your linear actuator can probably only reach that high. But if you move it all the way here, see, now it's able to reach, because it's much closer in. So it's kind of a compromise between that, between how far your linear actuator is able to extend um, and how much mechanical advantage you're going to get. Yeah, So the, and then the advantage of this, again, is that it's going to be typically much easier it's going to require a lot less torque. All right. Um, and this is what we talked about also, again, in the first lesson. We talked about how force is not going to be equal everywhere on the arm. Because it's actually related to the, dis the horizontal distance, which in this diagram is marked as D. Not the, you know, sort of the entire length of the arm. What's important there is the horizontal distance. So when your arm is out flat, it's going to have a lot more force put on it compared to when your arm is um is is more is either higher up or either lower down so kind of what you need to do then is you need to when you're adding your let's say you're adding some rubber bands when you're adding rubber bands you need to see that they're they're the most they're the most in tension when your arm is out straight that way because that's when the most force is going to be put on the motor and they have the least tension when the arm is either up or down ideally because that's that way you kind of have the same force and the motor is kind of uniform so that it has a very low amount of work needs to put into the entire motion of the arm. All right. Uh, some some design tips. We, we talked about most of them. We talked about adding a counterbalance, which is just adding that spring or that rubber band or even just another heavy weight at the end of it. Uh, and for arms, the whole point is that they're simple. So just keep them simple um, because, you know, if they're simple, they're more robust and they're easy to maintain and things like that. Um, and yeah. Oh, also one important thing is you want to add sensors to the arm. So that's more of a programming thing, but you need to design in mechanically where your sensors are going to go. So let's say you have a limit switch so that when the arm comes down, you know it's down and that's able to reset the encoders because now it knows it's at its lowest position. And you similarly have one at the top so the motor doesn't kill itself trying to go past a point it can't extend to. Um, well, even in that case, you'd actually want a mechanical stop as well so you don't break things on your robot. But additionally, so the software knows to stop putting, you know, it's going to start skipping gears or it's going to start stalling the motor out. You want sensors at least on its uh, highest extension point and its lowest extension point. So the software can always either like recalibrate where the arm is. If you've ever worked with a 3D printer, um, you should be familiar with this because every time it comes to home, it's always going to, you know, it's going to always go to its maximum. A sensor is going to detect that it's there and then it resets its encoders from there. Similarly with um, an arm, let's say you let's say you left it last game, like kind of halfway open and it's still able to stay there. When the game starts, if, they, if, if the software is going to be able to put it all the way down until it hits the limit switch. Once it does, now it's reset. Now it's at its home position. So that's why you need to design in limit switches, both for your most extended and least extended points. So make sure you add spaces um, where those can be activated. Another thing is think about like the limit switch is not going to be able to take that much force. So if the limit switch is really like, if it's stopping the arm, like let's say the limit switch is at the max point and it's the thing that's stopping the arm from going past that point, it's probably going to break. Especially if it's close to the pivot point, that's a lot of force on the limit switch. So try to think about that, that it shouldn't be really used to stop the arm. There should be something mechanically if you need to stop it from going past any point, but then it should also gently trigger the switch there. But the, the brunt of that work, the load should be taken by a mechanical structure, like a, a piece of aluminum or steel. Okay, moving on. Uh, so those, the only non-parallel lifts are just a single arm, right? That's everything else is parallel. And typically 
typically we use parallel lifts. There are situations where we can get away without using parallel lifts. Um, it just might not be that important, or it's just not a big factor in the game. In which, or or you literally only have two positions where you need to interact with something, or even maybe just one position where it's vital the way you interact with that object. In that case, you just kind of offset the angle of whatever mechanism at the end of the arm to be flat at that position, and then who cares what it is after that, right? If that's the case. Um, because it's obviously going to move. Because if you look at your arm, it's not going to remain parallel with the ground, right? The thing at the end of the arm, if it's bolted rigidly, is not going to stay parallel. It's going to, you know, this angle is going to deviate. Because if this is the arm over here, like that, it's now it's parallel to the ground. But as you lift it, it's that's, that's no longer parallel at all. If this is able to move, that's a whole different situation. But even then, how is it going to know to do to remain parallel? And you don't want to get in the whole headache of trying to add gyroscopes to it and trying to figure that out in software. That's a nightmare. That's not that's not robust design, and it's unlikely to work well. So what you do is you be able to parallel lift. However, if the only time you need it to be parallel to whatever object is it's in one position at the ground, then you can just you know let's say this is the arm like that. This is the position where you need it to be parallel. You just offset the angle at the end of the arm, so it's that way. It'll still not become parallel as the arm moves, but the point is it's parallel when you need it to be. Okay, but let's say you need it to be parallel at several different positions. Now, in that case, you're going to need to use a vast, or you can choose a vast array um, of parallel lifts to use. The first and simplest one is a four bar linkage. So, a four bar linkage is if you took an arm. So, look, if think about this um, like an arm, right? So, let's say the top uh, orange beam is our arm from before, right? If you remove everything else, like if you remove the orange beam below that, that's just an arm, right? Because it's just literally a, a rod going from one uh, from the tower to the blue square. And at that point, it's no longer parallel, and it just turns into an arm. Now, you take that arm, you copy-paste it a little bit below, and you attach it again to the tower and again to the, whatever object at the end. And that actually makes it parallel. It makes sure that the object is always parallel. Like you can see, when it's in its down position, it's still flat with the ground. And when it's in its high position, it's still flat against the ground. How is that possible? Uh, because the four bar is actually a parallelogram. And parallelograms, opposite sides are always parallel to each other. Like you can see in this um, demonstration here, which is just literally, it has nothing to do with robotics, which just, I'm, I'm trying to say that, well, it does, of course, have something to do with robotics, but uh, because in the sense that this is why a four bar works. This is not a robotics demonstration or This is just a demonstration, interactive demonstration for a parallelogram. So you can see that as I'm moving those points, in this case, D and C are fixed and A and B are moving. As I'm moving B up, you notice that it remains flat. It remains perpendicular in this case to the ground. Um, yeah, so that's why it works because it's it's it forms a parallelogram. You're, so consequently, op opposite um, sides also have to be the same length. So if you go back, you'll notice that those two orange um, lines are the same length, and the distance from the between the two connection points on the tower and on the blue box are also the same distance apart. And that gives you your parallelogram. So that's why it's able to stay parallel with the ground. The problem with uh, the four bar is it takes up a lot of space. So what you can do instead, actually, is you can have something called a virtual four bar. And a virtual four bar is you take an arm Right, you take your normal arm and then you add an additional sprocket that doesn't move in relation to the arm. So it's mounted rigidly somewhere else. It does not move in relation with the arm. And then you add chain and you attach the other side of the sprocket on the end of your arm. And now that's able to freely pivot on your arm. What that's going to do is that's going to also allow it to be um, a four bar because your chain is effectively acting like a four bar, keeping everything uh, sort of in place. Keep making, it's giving you that um, uh, parallelogram right there in that chain. So now what we can do is we can watch like a five-year-old um, do everything that we can do but better, and we can get explained to it by her. So just watch this video and let me know if you can hear any audio. Hi, I'm Milo Marks. Did you hear that? Yep. You did? Okay, perfect. I promise this is this is informational video. 409B, and I'm going to show you how to make a virtual 4 bar. This is a side view of a 2 bar lift. The downside to it is that right now it is parallel with the ground, but when you move it, it's now perpendicular. 
This this is a four bar lift. It's called a four bar because it has four bars. One, two, three, and four. The the good side of it is that it keep the object the claw and object keep its orientation no matter how far it's turned. See how it's perpendicular to the uh, to the ground right now. And unlike the two bar, when we raise it up, it stays perpendicular. Why does it do that? Because it's a parallelogram. These two sides will always stay parallel. It's geometry, man. <laughs> this is a four bar in action. Watch how the hub always stays at the same orientation to the floor. This is called a virtual four bar. The, the parallelogram for this one is inside this chain. This is a model. See how the pink piece keeps its orientation? Here you can see the parallelogram. Here's how it works. This sprocket down here stays completely stationary and is at the same pivot point as the two bar. Then it has a chain going up to here with uh, connecting to the shaft that ha that connects to the intake. Well, when, if, since this uh, stays stationary, it stays at, uh, everything stays at the same orientation, making this stay flat and parallel to the ground. The poly, the, the parallelogram for this robot, for this design, is inside of the chain. So right, it goes right here, to there, to there, to there. Because the chain can't extend, the chain stays the same length on each side. It has to be two shafts and two separate shafts. One needs to stay stationary, while this one needs to be able to move to control the arm. And basically, it take it takes the problem of the space that the four bar takes up and takes that down to a minimal size of the size of a two bar and it works just the same okay great so hopefully that everyone found that informational um and hopefully everyone realizes that there's also always going to be someone younger and smarter than you uh but besides that that's a great demonstration of how that works um and hopefully everyone understands how that works and i'm just gonna ask take a moment now to see if there are any questions about both the arm driving it at the pivot point versus driving it close to the pivot point uh, at for the four bar and for the virtual four bar. Are there any questions? Would the chain in a virtual four bar be taking a lot of stress? Probably, but I mean, it's, it's probably fine. Just use metal chain. Like that's, she used plastic chain because that's effects IQ. That's all you're allowed to use. But um, it would likely be under a lot of stress, but the chain is typically going to be resilient enough to take that stress. And it might expand over time as well, which is why you will have to add a tensioning mechanism typically um, so that your chain is gonna always remain nice and tight. But yeah, it would be under a lot of stress. It's not gonna break though. It's unlikely that it's gonna break, especially because in FRC we use some pretty big chain. But I mean, even in VEX, they use plastic chain and typically at least on VEX IQ, that doesn't break either. I've seen it on Infex also, so the metal chain is definitely going to survive. Are there any other questions? No? Okay. Sounds good. Let's continue. So the next type of lift we have is, I well, I call it a cascade lift, but technically cascade is not a type of lift. It's the way the wires are connected. So it's kind of technically that there's two separate lifts, a cascade and continuous lifts. Um, and the difference, they look very similar, but the difference lies in the way that they're wired. But effectively, they achieve the same thing. They have some pros and cons of their own. Um, but essentially, you have a bunch of slides, linear slides attached um, beside each other. And then you run some string through them in a magical way. And when you pull the motor, they're all going to go up um, eventually. So. So the first one goes up, then the next one, then the next one, it kind of just stacks on top of each other, and they keep going higher and higher up. Um, 
with continu with continuous lifts, the advantage. Well, I'm not really going to go into the specific advantages and disadvantages of continuous versus cascade because they're pretty similar. Just just understand that uh, in terms of in terms of these two lifts, they're because they're very close together. You essentially have either like um, 80, 20 uh, aluminum T slots or some kind of any kind of maybe even a drawer slide, any type of linear you know sliding mechanism, and you stack a bunch of them side by side. And when you pull the string, you kind of just copy this configuration of how it's uh, laid out over here. Um, you'll notice that when the motor spins, you're going to pull it up. And when it spins the other way, you're going to pull it down. I'll speak to the continuous lift, um, how, that, how that sort of wiring of the cable goes. So if you look at the red cable, that's the cable that's going to contribute towards lifting it up. And the yellow cable is going to be what contributes towards lifting it down. It's actually the same cable. They've just been kind of, you know, colored so it's easy to talk about and easy to understand. So if you look at the red cable, the way that's going to work is if you imagine all those stages right now, they're all, you know, mostly extended. If you kind of contract them all and they all come down beside each other and they're almost all almost at the same height, then at that point, if you kind of pull, it'll, it'll go it'll go through all those pulleys, right? Because those red dots are basically pulleys, so it'll kind of smoothly go through all of that. And if you look at the last one, the one that's actually attached to the, you know, the triangle and the blue square, if you look at that, it's going to be getting pulled. Um, the, it's going to be getting pulled from the... So if you assume that the triangle and blue square can also move along that slide, then it's going to be getting pulled from a higher place, right? Because the pulley is above it and there's tension, so it's going to slide up. But once that hits the pulley, it can't go up anymore. Okay, so that's all becomes basically one rigid body now. That pulley is not going to move. Everything turns rigid there. If you continue following it down, you go, you go down to the bottom pulley. Okay, that's not really helpful. That's also rigid at this point because it's under tension. But now, if you go up to the next pulley, the higher the top pulley on the next slide, um, in this case, don't. In this case, it's going to be contracted down. Then it's going to be pulling tension on the bottom pulley of the on the of the last slide, which is going to pull it up, and so on and so forth. So, and then that's how it goes up. And then when it goes down, when you spin the motor the other way. That yellow um, string attached to the bottom of the blue block is just going to pull it down directly. Everything is going to collapse, and in the similar, and at the same time, the red string is going to be, you know, kind of contracted because the motor is spinning the other way. So those are I call them cascade lifts generally, but technically the one on the left is a cascade lift, and the way the one on the right is wired is called sorry, the one on the left is called a continuous lift, and the one on the right is called a cascade lift. I generally refer to them both as cascade lifts. Um, but technically, that's not what they are called. Okay, the next one is the DR4B. It's uh, which actually stands for double reverse four bar. Um, it's called. It's kind of a not. It's kind of coming. It's really complicated to build in FRC. That's why you can see that it says extreme design double reverse four bar. It's not really that extreme um, because it's. I mean, it's been done in FRC. Uh, and it, literally every other game in Vex, you have a double reverse four bar. So if you're a Vex team or if you've ever done Vex, uh, double reverse four bars, you, you basically know how they work. Um, they're pretty complicated to explain how they actually work because there's a lot of linkages like you can see um, going on. But essentially, it's the animation that in the four separate images you can see, it contracts down really small. And then when you expand, when you push on the bottommost linkage, sort of all the linkages activate in tandem all going up. So you can get a really small profile and it can expand really high up. Um, and yeah, typically you don't see it that much in FRC. It has been done in FRC though before. Um, and it's been done a couple times, especially from teams that have both VEX and FRC in their schools, uh, because you know they are like, oh wait, why don't we just apply this to FRC? Um, it works sometimes, sometimes it doesn't because the stresses on it kinda, it's not the most stable lift, especially when you scale it up to FRC size. Uh, it's gonna. It's not really gonna handle side loads too well. It's gonna be pretty wobbly when it's actually eight feet tall instead of like two feet in vex. So, it it it's been done successfully before, but it's pretty complicated um, and not really something I'd recommend going with, at least not an FRC. The next one, which is probably opposite of the DR4B because how common it is um, in FRC is the elevator. So. The elevator, you typically have actually multiple stages. So if you just think about one stage, first of all, um, one stage, you're just going to have something on the outside that's rigid and doesn't move. You have a track on the inside that's able to slide on the inside of that. 
and then you have a pulley at the top. You pull the string from the bottom, the carriage gets pulled up the track. Now you basically take that, you put it in another track, and you string it properly. You can have that happen for multiple stages. So first the carriage goes up, that hits the top of that, then it, and then it pulls the second stage up with it. So you can get actually a lot higher lift if you start stacking stages. Typically, you don't go past two stages. Um, but yeah, because two stages can also already get you really high up. So two, maybe three, typically it's two stages um, are used in FRC. Uh, the good thing about an elevator is it's super robust. Like it's very structurally sound. It's, it's not simple, especially when you have multiple stages, but it's definitely simpler than something like this. So you have that design simplicity in there. Definitely not the simplest on this list, um, but you, you get a lot of reach with a relatively simple uh, design. And additionally, you're gonna wanna have it so that uh, you can't extend each stage all the way. Because if you extend each stage all the way and there's only minimal contact within you know, the second, the stage uh, outside of it, it's gonna wobble like crazy. So this, I think this guy says around 20% overlap you want, um, and you can kind of start re reducing that overlap the higher you go up. So on the outermost stage, you want the most overlap and then less and less and less as you go towards the inside, kind of like you're laying down the foundation for your house, um, which I think what they talk about in this slide. Yeah. So you need you need you need some overlap on your uh, elevator because you need if you don't have any overlap, you can have very minimal contact and that's going to wobble, might break it. Um, so you do want some contact, and then you can start reducing the contact and the overlap as you start going in the inner more stages. Uh, and yes, you, you can also rig the elevator in continuous or cascade style. Something to play around with, definitely. Um, typically, we just do whatever the guide tells you to, um, because you know there, there are advantages for continuous and cascade. I believe cascade typically actuates faster, but it puts a lot more stress on the actual motor. Um, and then, but yeah, again, as with all lifts, actually, you want to add sensors um, so that it knows when the stage is the highest, when the stage is at its highest point, and when it's at its lowest point. All right. The next thing you've got is a telescoping arm. So telescoping arms are pretty cool. Uh, the, disadvantage, the, oops, the disadvantage is that you have to um, custom machine them typically because you need to find a box and then a smaller box and then a smaller box inside of that box. Um, and then you have, you have to kind of leave some space so you can add these springs. So that's the disadvantage is that you need to custom machine it um, and you need to find the parts that kind of fit together well. Well, you can't find parts that fit together. You have to make parts that fit together well. Um, so yeah, as you can kind of see on the image on the left, it's kind of, it goes down to a really small profile and on the right, you can see it expand up really high. The way that actually works is that, uh, so the image in the middle kind of shows you the cross section of one of those is you would actually have some space on one of the sides. So you can see that on the image on the right, you have these kind of ridges. So on the blue one, it's on the right hand side and on the green one, it's on the left hand side. Those ridges are your tracks. So that's how it stays, you know, kind of linear and doesn't wobble around. Those are the tracks. But then on the other side, so on this on the face that's perpendicular to the face with the ridge, you have a space, like a, this pretty big gap between the wall, the box that surrounds it, and the inner box. And within that space is where you're gonna put your CF springs, which stands for constant force springs. Basically, it's just a spring that has the same amount of force even when it's fully extended versus when it's fully contracted. So typically, if you think about a rubber band, the more you stretch a rubber band, the more and more force it's going to put on that rubber band. A constant force spring is not like that. It just has a certain length, and throughout the entire length, it puts the same amount of force on the entire thing. So uh, you could, and so you basically you put that so that the whole system at all times, so you put, you actually need a couple of pairs. So you'd put two constant force springs, let's say on the top of the red thing, on the top of the red stage connected to the bottom of the blue stage and on the top of the blue stage connected to the bottom of the green stage. So it would always wanna contract and pull each stage up to its max. So the whole system always wants to go up and then you have a wire that connects, or like, let's, I mean, sorry, a piece of string that connects um, to the, the amp, the top of the first, sorry, the top of the last stage. So in this case is the green stage. You could, you could connect it to that kind of red sort of thing on top. You connect it to that so that only when the motor lets go, the tower can shoot up. And if it wants to retract, the motor can recoil. The thing with this is that if whatever you put on the end is really heavy, your constant force springs might not be able to actually lift it up, 
right? Because if it's too much weight, it's not gonna have the it's not gonna have the force to lift it up. But the good thing is you can actually have you can actually pull down with a lot of force because it's such connected to a motor, and you can have that motor have a really high torque ratio. So this made is makes it ideal for actually hanging, right? If you're trying to hang with um, if you're trying to use this to hang, you have you have to have very minimal force to send it up because all you the only thing you're lifting is some really light cloth. And then you need all the force coming down, which is where you get that force uh, because your motor is actually going to be coiling it where your motor is going to be spinning to pull it down. Whereas to go up, your motor is just letting it go and the springs are pulling it up. So very good for a hanging mechanism. Disadvantage is that you need to kind of, you know, think to yourself, talk to the manufacturing teacher, see what resources we have. Uh, can we machine this? Because it's all custom because you, they can't, there can't be an off the shelf part for it because each stage is going to get smaller and smaller and smaller. So everything is custom, right? Okay. So that makes sense because, and that's another thing. So depending on how many stages you want, you need to make sure that your initial stage is big enough. They can fit the other stages inside of it. All right. Uh, are there any questions about that? I don't know how good, how well I explained kind of how it's able to go up and down with the motor connected to it. So like basically, actually, let me, let me try something. Let me see if I can actually pull this up um, so I can actually show you. Let me try giving that a shot very quickly. Um, and that'll be interactive then. So in the meantime, though, are there any questions about anything that's been covered so far? No? OK. Then let me just go ahead and share this really quickly. Um, just to show it a little bit more clearly. So this is actually custom. I am I catted this kind of thing last year when I was when we were talking about designs to do for the lift in the 2020 season. Uh, and the way this works, so here is the section I was talking about where you have that kind of gap. And in that gap, you'd have a constant force spring kind of bolted to these threaded holes. And then that would be attached to the bottom of this green tube. So that when it's all the way contracted down, all the stations are contracted down. Uh, you'd see that on the red, so right over here on the red face, you'd have a constant force spring and that would be connected to the bottom. So if we lift this up all the way up, that would be connected to the bottom over here. So that it would always want the bottom of the blue stage to be connected to the top because that's what that's where it's in under tension from. And same thing on the blue stage, you do the same thing to the green one. So now if you think about it, the default is that it wants to spring up. What's preventing it from springing up? So basically how do we control it is the fact that if you look down here, there's a route for the pulley to actually come, the string to actually come out. So if you actually take a section analysis um, of this really quickly, you kind of dig away at some of this, you'll notice that these stages are hollow from the inside, okay? So I would route the string, right? I'll just tie it to one of those holes, which is at the top of over here, that's that hole. I would just tie it to that. And then on the bottom, that would come out all the way through those stages. It would come through the center, the innermost stage, because they're all hollow. And then it would, you know, then it would, after that, it would just come out through that pulley mechanism. It would just come out through here, and then that would be connected to whatever motor. So when the motor is in tension and it's holding it, this won't be able to go up. As soon as the motor lets go, by that amount, it'll be able to go up. So hopefully that makes sense. Now, uh, I'm going to start sharing the presentation again, but does that make sense? Does everyone understand? Yeah. All right, perfect. Uh, I think there's a question. Do they all use only motors or are there others perhaps pneumatic and hydraulic? So with your pneumatic, okay, there's no hydraulic. It's only pneumatic. Um, but with pneumatic, um, you're going to have it so that uh, your pneumatic cylinder is only going to be extent able to extend its stroke length. Whatever the stroke length from the manufacturer is, that's it, which is typically nothing in terms of how high these lifts need to go. So if you're only going to just use that, you're not going to get very high at all. Um, but if you think about, no, there are, like we do use them. If you go back over here, uh, the problem with pneumatics though, right? Uh, this Aditya, pneumatics are either on or off. They're either in the most extended position or they're the least extended position, which means you have no variability. So your lift is either fully extended or not extended at all, which typically for most situations is a problem. Um, but there are examples of where you could, like, let's say over here, you see that, that linear actuator, typically you would use the linear actuator because that way you have, you have steps in between where the arm can be. 
But for some reason, if you only need bottom and top, that's all you need, you can actually connect inside of a linear actuator. And this arm, you could have a pneumatic cylinder, uh, so that pneumatic piston, so that when it extends, it's at its up highest position, and when it retracts, it's at its lowest position. Does that make sense? I did to you. Why are we thinking of using linear actuators on last year's robot? Hence why we were, yes, yes. Hence why we're thinking, yes. So, so for the shooter, um, we wanted to have variability on it. Uh, so that way, you know, because you could adjust you know, the angle. If it was just pneumatics, it would either be that or that. There is no this. So that's why we're using, that's why we're considering using linear actuators, yes. We ended up going with pneumatics. Yeah, we chose pneumatics in the end because in, in, real, in the end, we chose nothing. It was just rigidly mounted at one fixed angle because we didn't want to mess around with that type of stuff. Um, we chose rhythm, chose pneumatics. I was talking, I, I was advocating for linear actuators so that we'd be able to choose the angle. Rhythm decided to go with pneumatics because he did not, because obviously linear actuators are going to take a lot longer. They use a lead screw, so it's going to take a lot longer to change the angle. Uh, and he wanted to have fast action. Fast action, you have to use pneumatics. That's going to mean you can only shoot from one spot in the field. You, you can change the RPM of the flywheels, which is going to give you some adjustability. But as we mentioned, changing the angle is always better because you have more control. So that's what the so at that point we can only have one angle fixed. It's either retracted, which means you can't shoot, or extended, which is, so you have one angle you can shoot from. And then at the very end, we completely scrapped that and just rigidly mounted it at one angle. That makes sense. Okay, sounds good. No problem. Uh, so where were we? We were here. Okay, the next one. Um, so now you're getting into the type of sort of the systems that are not going to get you very far. So your linear actuators, your pneumatics, and your rack and pinion, those are not going to get you high at all. That's if you need some type of linear movement it could even be horizontal movement, but if we're talking about lifts in this case, you're not going to be able to go very high. If you don't need to go very high, that works. Um, because the problem with rack and pinion is whatever height you want to reach, your robot has to be permanently fixed higher than that. Because your track, your rack track actually needs to contain the whole length of that. And you can't you can't retract that. So at that point, you can only um sorry, I apologize. Uh you can have multiple stages, so you're, you're basically able to double once. But typically, you don't have multiple stages. You only have one stage um, with rack and pinion because multiple stages are very messy. You now you need multiple motors and things like that. So you just have one stage, um, and it's basically able to double its height. So sorry, it's not able to just um, go to the height of the track, but that's an option as well. You could have like, you know, the track go all the way up, and then it just follows the track. Uh, but typically, with like what you can see in this image, you have you know, a fixed uh, track and then a moving track inside, you have your pinion fixed and your rack is the thing that moves, um, which is able to, you know, move it to twice its height. So it, you're not gonna be able to get very far. It's the same thing. So this, so rack and pinion, linear actuator, pneumatics, they're all able to go a little bit less than double their initial starting height, which in most cases is not far enough. Um, but if it is far enough, then they're all really great options. Be careful with pneumatics though, because pneumatics... Um, as I mentioned, they're either all the way extended or not extended at all. So you don't have any in-between area there. So if you need that, you can't use pneumatics. Additionally, if you're going to use pneumatics, make sure you use pneumatics. Like, use it everywhere. Try to make the max of it because there's so much cost that goes into adding pneumatics on the robot that if you're not using it to its fullest, it's not worth it. And I don't mean money. I just mean, like, space and, like, you have to add it to your system and all that stuff. You need a compressor, a storage tank, cylinders. So if you're going to use it, use it. Otherwise, don't. And yeah, the, I think this last one. Yes, yes, no. No, it's not the last one. Okay, yeah. So it's the last one of the normal lift, and then we'll get into the weirder ones. Um, so you have your scissor lift, uh, which is basically just a bunch of crisscrossing channels, and it can like go really small down, and it can extend really high up. And then you have a motor. In this case, it's rack and pinion. It could be a linear actuator. Uh, pushing the edge of it, and then that's going to you know, kind of close it in, and all those stages are going to expand out. It's going to go higher up. Uh, bad lift. It's not really a good lift for FRC. Great lift for FTC VEX because in FRC, 
um, it's too big, it's too, weighs too much. The lateral loads are really going to mess it up. FTC and FRC, it works not, uh, sorry, FTC and Vexa works with smaller robots, but not with bigger FRC robots um, because it does not deal well with side loads at all. So typically not a good option um, if it's going really high. All right, now we've got hybrid designs. So hybrid designs, uh, you basically got an elevator plus an arm. That's one of the one example, okay? So you have the elevator we talked about and your arm. The advantage of, on, on the elevator. Advantage of that is you're more easily able to stay within frame perimeter because if you need to reach an object outside of frame perimeter, then you need some way of extending horizontally as well. Not too far, just a little bit, but you need that ability. So that's going to give you additional horizontal and vertical reach, which is, how, which is very helpful. Uh, and yeah, so this, even if you want, you can make this a virtual four bar or an actual four bar, or it could just be a normal arm. Um, which could be fine as well. You have your arm plus telescope. So in this case, it's just a normal arm that's able to pivot at its pivot point, but then the arm can also extend itself. So from within it, it typically only one stage, and it's able to extend even further from that arm. They, these should be pretty simple to understand. Uh, just, just, just don't. We don't talk about this one. This is this one's whack. Imagine like you took a really big three D printer and you stuck it on your robot. It's like an elevator, both vertically and horizontally. It's crazy. Like, just don't. I feel like at that point, you should just give up if you really need to do that. Um, no, but for real, this one's pretty complicated. Uh, and you definitely don't want to do this if you can avoid it. A lot of stuff will go wrong. Very complicated in general. You don't want to do it. At that point, you basically, you just list, you're missing one dimension. There you go. You've, be, you've got a massive 3D printer. Um, so yeah, that's a big no-no. Uh, but yeah, those are the different kind of combination lifts um, you've got here. You got these are these are pretty simple. This one is just ridiculously complicated, so we're not going to talk about it. Um, and yeah, there's, there's, there's many many different kinds of lifts. I thought this class was going to end early. I underestimated lifts, like most people often do, um, and it took the entire class. But that's great. So we, we got to have a full lesson there. Um, at this point, are there any questions about actually anything we've covered in mechanical throughout the year? Because this remember this is our last class. So if you have any questions, now is the time. Questions about anything we, which of course includes what we covered today. Awesome. I'm glad to hear that. Maxwell, you got any questions? Nope. Sounds good. Aditya, MB, you got any questions? No questions? Okay, awesome. Just for anyone watching. What, what for anyone watching, Aditya? Oh, what kind of tools would we have available? Meaning like hand tools? Or like what, what do you mean what kind of tools? Like what kind of machining tools? Like how can we manipulate our metal? Like that? Is that what you mean? Like we would have drills, obviously, screwdrivers. Generally, uh, you'd have the machine shop in the school which means you have a lathe, drill press, milling machine. You have like a kind of CNC machine, but like that thing barely works. So I wouldn't count on that. You have a laser cutter, 3D printer. Those are your fabrication tools. You also have like obviously simpler tools. You have a drill, you have an angle grinder. Uh, you have a bandsaw. I don't know if I mentioned that before. You have screwdrivers, everything, wrenches, all that type of stuff. You're going to have to help build your robot. I wouldn't count on the CNC though. It's kind of sketchy. So yeah, and I think it broke last year for the majority of the year. We only had it towards the end. You basically have everything besides like complicated stuff. You have all the basic machine shop tools. Screws, nuts, rivets, obviously all that stuff. And yeah, are there any other questions? No? All right, so then we can end today's last and final class. Um, stay tuned for updates on the design challenge, which will be coming out, well, not soon, but will be coming out eventually. Um, and you'll get to apply all these skills in kind of a fun virtual competition, which is going to try its best to emulate the actual competition. It's not going to do that, of course, because it's not the actual competition, and we can't even be in person but it's going to try its best.
And that's it for today, guys. Then thank you all for coming. Uh, this recording will stop when it needs to because I can't stop it. So we'll just trim this bit out. Um, and that'll be all for today. Bye, everyone.